Hello from the Adler Planetarium. Uh, my name is Andrew Johnson. I'm the Vice President for Astronomy Collections at the Adler. As all of you know out there, we are celebrating and commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 mission, one of the most uh, well-known stories about space exploration. However, it's a story that has a lot of details. Uh, in Chicago at the Adler, we were hoping to put on a, a series of programs uh, on our site there, but instead we're all working remotely, uh, as, as you are. And I'm speaking today with uh, Jerry Woodfield, who's a robotics engineer at Johnson Space Center at NASA. Uh, but it, more importantly to our story today, he was one of the engineers working for the Apollo program at Johnson Space Center in Houston there during the whole Apollo program, including Apollo 13. Hello, Jerry, how are you? Well, good afternoon, Andrew. It's good to be able to share with your audience. It's an honor. I just thank you that you give me this opportunity to share my experience, which goes back. I've been at NASA 55 years. I'm not yet retired. No, and that's so, amazing. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm a young guy. I'm just 77 years old. So uh, when I get into my older years, maybe I'll think about retiring then. Yeah, you got it. Then we'll do another one of these discussions when you actually get older. We'll, we'll, we'll talk then, okay? Um, That'll be great. Cool. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what led you uh, to to NASA. Um, if there's a couple of items that people know about the history of space exploration, one of the things that people have read about or seen video or, or heard audio um, is, is a famous speech that happened. President John F. Kennedy gave a speech at, at Rice University, uh, which is now Rice University, um, uh, where he publicly set a goal, getting humans to the moon and back. It just so happens that our friend Jerry here was in the stadium at the time. Tell us a little bit about uh, what it was like to be there and, and what kind of motivation it gave you. Well, Andrew, I was there on a bo basketball scholarship. I'm from Indiana, about 40 miles from where you are right now. And uh, I played Indiana basketball and based on one game and one game I had 20 points and the coach at Rice University based on that one game gave me a full basketball scholarship. Only offer I had, so I found are, are, myself. Are, are you saying you weren't averaging 20 points a game? That was the only game, and uh, <laughs> it was a miracle game. Can you imagine that? Based on one game, I got a full basketball scholarship, only offer I had. So that brought me down to Rice. And so at Rice in 1962, in September 12th, I was in Rice Stadium, and John Kennedy came, and he began to talk. He says, we do this thing not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Now, he was talking about going to the moon. Well, I was not doing well academically. And so I thought, well, if we can go to the moon, I can actually graduate. Well, I did. I got a degree in electrical engineering at Rice University. And the president's speech is one of the real things that motivated me to actually press on. I gave up my basketball scholarship, much to the delight of the coach. And I... <laughs> focused on my studies and I uh, did well my final years and and so NASA hired me and I was hired as the alarm system engineer the only guy that ever did that in the Apollo program I was the alarm system engineer for the mothership that I'm showing you here and I was the alarm system engineer for the lunar lander and uh, your audience if they haven't seen the movie Apollo 13 well they no there were two ships that went to the moon the mothership that actually took them out there and back, and the lunar lander that then went down to the lunar surface. Well, I was responsible for the alarm system for this mothership, as well as the alarm system for the lander. I was 22 years old. Wait, so at, at 22, that was your first job? You went straight into alarm system manager for a Yes, right. Oh. It started out, they gave me all the, I was an engineer for all the switches and gauges, and part of that was the alarm system too. Well, soon as guys came off of the Gemini program, they took the switches and gauges, but they left me the alarm system. And then the man that was responsible for the alarm system, he left NASA for a better paying job. So I had all the alarm systems, the only guy in the whole NASA program to have that. And so, you know, when they landed on the moon, uh, you know, I was there monitoring my alarm system. But the reason that I was responsible in a, it's a group called the Mission Engineering Room or the MER, the Mission Evaluation Room. Now, let me share that with your audience. Everybody thinks, well, there's just the astronauts. There's the flight controller. There's another group. It's a very important group. It's like 
called the mission of we were the engineers that is we were the people that actually designed the alarm system designed these old systems designed what made it did the engine designs so we were an engineering group and up until the time of the apollo one fire i had worked with gus grissom ed white and roger yeah. chaffee and i had been with them because I had the alarm system. If you've got the alarm system, they want to know what you're doing. I mean, obviously the guy that's going to be responsible for yeah, things, the crew, you mean, yeah, right. yeah. You, you're going to want to know it. And so I worked with Roger and Ed and Gus at, for a meeting and I was at the manufacturers and they asked me about the alarm system. I said, well, I've done the best I can, but it had problems. It not only the alarm system, but the entire craft. Well, those problems became very serious. In fact, about a month, well, three months after I was with them, I was having dinner one night and my wife and I, and I heard on the TV, there's been an accident at Cape Kennedy. And what had happened, there had been, while they were in the craft actually testing it out, there'd been a short circuit under Gus Grissom's couch that had ignited the flammable materials in there. And I've also wondered, could my alarm system have saved those gentlemen? No, it couldn't have, because there was no fire extinguisher even on board. Yeah. It took five minutes to open the hatch. So as a result of that fire, they said, we need another group. We need a group of engineers that every time we have an Apollo mission, we've got this group of engineers. If something gets real tough, we can go to those guys that designed everything, and we're going to put them in a room, and it's going to be called the Mission Evaluation Room. And yeah, so the, 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 that's one of the outcomes of the Apollo 1 fire, it's another example. It is. That's right. It's, it's, it's an outgrowth of that. And uh, if you can see this, this is a picture. See that in the bottom there? That's the yeah, mission. I, 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 I've seen that picture. It's, it's really interesting that, that when people, you're right, when people think about mission control, it's this big fancy room with giant screens, you know, but, but you all at least had a couple TV sets, uh, you know, up there on the ceiling, but it was a lot less fancy of a room, wasn't it? Well, this is a room that's in a building adjacent to it. So right. when Gene Krantz or any of the other flight controllers had a real problem, which they did in Apollo 13, sure. that they'd never seen before, they sure. would contact our group. In fact, remember what happened when they didn't have enough uh, cleaners for the carbon dioxide? Remember that? They that couldn't. Came that came over to your room, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, my, so, okay. my alarm system began to ring alarms. So, and, uh, so I want to I want to get to the CO two scrubber because because it's one of the best parts of the story. But when um, but let's let's skip to Apollo thirteen. And so when when word came down that uh, well alarms were going off, uh, of course. But uh, and then you were uh, you said in, in the adjacent room. Did it take long for you all to figure out? Boy, this is a serious problem. Or did you know right away? Okay, here's what happened. I had my headset on. It was on my shift. You know, it's always, I thought, providential that when it happened, I was there. You know, Gene Krantz, when it happened, he was there. So that's really important. So I was looking at the measurements, actually the telemetry measurements of what was going on with the spacecraft. And all of a sudden, I saw that screen begin to flicker. You know, it's like an old black and white TV that doesn't got good reception. I said, what's going on here? It's flickering. Mm -hmm. Then I heard in my headset, Houston, we've had a problem and my alarm had come on. So you're you're talking to the guy here responsible for the famous quote, Houston, we've had a problem because the alarm, they heard in their headset this alarm and they saw this, my alarm light, the, the master alarm light, and then they heard the explosion and that produced the statement, Houston, we've had a problem. Got it. And so my thought was, wow, my system, I, there were five or six alarms that came on at once. The first alarm was called main bus B undervolt. Now that's one of the parameters that I had designed into the system to warn the astronauts, the main bus B. Well, then other alarms came. I said, oh my goodness, I've got a real problem. I said, it can't be this bad. It's Jerry's system. He's going to have to answer some things. And then all of a sudden in my headset, I heard Jim Lovell say, we see something venting. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> there is a real problem. It's not my system. And as soon as Jim Lovell said that, I realized that we had problems, that my alarm system had been the first to alert them to. Oh, so, 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 so it all happened pretty quickly in terms of you 
realizing, oh no, this is a real serious problem because because it it, it was less than a minute that all those things were said over the radio. Yep, right. That's right. I see. Yeah, okay. yeah it yeah. was it, it, four seconds after I saw that screen flicker is when you know the alarm was re they reset the alarm and then I heard Houston, we've had a problem. So it was almost immediately uh, that. Uh, that it happened, you know. Um, and then when okay. Jim said, we see something venting, that's when I knew for sure there was an actual well, problem. Well, I think well, Jim says well, the same thing. Yeah, okay. well, well, when, when you hear that, whether you're in the eval room or, or mission control, when you hear that over the radio, you, you know it's a real, you know, it's the real well, thing. The problem, you know, they still wrestled, they still wrestled with the thing. Oh, they did. Oh. They were, yeah, and you know, uh, it, this is the most remarkable thing. Uh, they had actual, telescope on the top of an adjacent building and they're actually looking at the spacecraft huh. and when the thing exploded in the eyepiece of the telescope they could actually see the explosion huh. <laughs> you know this is the most remarkable thing and so different people you know i don't think jim lovell even wanted to admit right away that they weren't going to be able to land on the moon yeah. you know he was looking at the my fuel cell lights and then he saw two of the fuel cells were you know indicating they'd failed and he thought well maybe if the last few but nobody really wanted to you say oh we we can't do it you but, know, you, so, but, but you you probably had it figured out pretty pretty rapidly that as that, soon as i saw that heard those words we right. see something that i knew that was real serious yeah, because and, 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 Go ahead, and that this was a, this was then going to change into how do we get these guys back alive, right? I mean, that's the uh, that that's what happened. Yeah. In fact, uh, I have so many stories, but it was an oxygen tank that had exploded. A short circuit in a tank had blew it out. Right. And Jim, I'm, I've listened to Jim say he saw his O2 tank one pressure uh, go down to that. Well, yeah, it was gone. It just blew out right. of space. Right. right, the gauge was correct, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, O2 tank two was gone. And then O2 tank one, because the, the, the plumbing had fractured, it was bleeding off its thing. So eventually there wouldn't be any oxygen to feed the fuel cells, so they'll lose all their power. So all these things I began to see, and it's fortuitous, had had O2 tank one been the one to explode, it would have killed them right there. They right. would have died in 55 hours into the mission. They would have died right there because O2 tank one is in the interior of the craft and it would have taken two out, one out, and then there's hydrogen tanks above it. And it would have been like a comet. We would have seen a comet because yeah, with the all the hydrogen right? oxygen yeah. did have yeah. died right there. Um, but, okay, so, so, so then after, after the explosion then, obviously, your uh, I, your work schedule, I'm pretty certain, went out the window, right? You, you figured, okay, I'm going to be working here uh, pretty consistently. What, what were the first okay. couple of challenges? Okay, the first challenge is, now remember, the flight controllers have to deal with the immediate problems. We're the guys that are engineers and evaluating things, okay? okay? So as problems came up, of course, I stayed another two hours. My shift was over at uh, 10 o'clock, but because of the serious situation, those of us that really had been involved, we stayed around. Other groups were called in right away. For example, the man responsible for uh, cleaning up the carbon dioxide out of the air, you remember right. that scene in the movie? Right. Well, he was called in right away. Our power engineer that knew how to charge up entry batteries, see the batteries in this craft had to be used uh, because the, the, the main main power system wouldn't work. So we had to use these batteries in the entry capsule and we depleted them. So they called the guy responsible for the, the, the power in the lunar lander in and he figured out a way of jumper charging power from this craft into the batteries to re-enter their statement. So a lot of guys were called in in the engineering room, called in right away. Now, and I, 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 I just want to add for people that are, that are less familiar with, with these spacecraft that uh, what Jerry was just talking about is, is you basically had two spacecraft in one, one of which would land on the moon, the other which would go there uh, and back. And they weren't designed to do all this, but on the fly, you had to figure out how do we transfer electrical power between the two and so forth. Yeah, That's right. After about an hour, I think hour and a half, it was very obvious that we were going to have to use this lunar lander like a lifeboat, like a Titanic's lifeboat. But this thing was designed for two men for about two days. Right. And it was going to take three men, you know, to, to get to the moon and back it takes a, a week and a half. And right. so how do you make this thing last for the whole trip back to Earth with three guys? Well, what are you going to do? You know, there's people speculate, well, maybe they'll have to just 
kick one guy overboard. You know, he'll just have to give up and give <laughs> enough power there for the other guy. And things like that, thoughts came to a lot so, of people. So, so we were confident we can pick, we can save him. Oh, yeah, actually, I, I want to get to that later about, about the confidence level. But, but that, so after the initial um, alarms, right, where, where all the engineers are figuring out how to solve these problems, and you're putting in long hours, I, I assume that even after alarms weren't going off, that you were still very much involved in it, or was it true that alarms were still going on and you were responding to those kinds of things? <laughs> here's here's the situation. Uh, we have shifts. We have shifts. Now, Gene Krantz was on his shift in, in the op, in machine operations control room. So Glenn Lunny's coming on. So you have all of Gene's flight controllers, and then you have Glenn's and his flight, and they're all together. Okay, so the men that are with Gene, they're telling the guys that were with Glenn, here's what's going on. And so they're transitioning to the next group. So that's exactly the way that our room was working. There was somebody coming on to replace me. So I shared with him what had gone on so he could pick up then and I could go home. <laughs> were, your, were, your, were your shifts in the in the mission eval room synced up with the with the with pretty the, much? Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. All right. 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 pretty much. They coincided with the shifts in the mission control room. And so, okay, so the next day, uh, you they do the same thing. You'd come for your shift, and then then they would let you know what had happened. You know. So here's the thing, though, Man, mission evaluation room. So. The problem was these alarms would come on after they got into this lunar lander and used it as a life boat. The alarms would come on and they'd say, well, Jerry, this alarm came on. Uh, why did it come on? Now, the problem is with my system, the alarm would just stay on while the problem existed. For example, but yeah, I turned on my air conditioner uh, last night. You know, we were my wife and I. It's kind of hot down here in Houston, by the way. Uh, yeah, not, not here in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when the AC, but the lights would get dim. So with my alarm system, uh, for example, when the the uh, CO2, the carbon dioxide, when it was beginning to get so high that we were beginning to worry that it might cause them to get drowsy and right. actually die on their own breath, my alarm would kind of come on. And uh, but it wouldn't stay on because it was like when that AC came, it would just turn the master alarm would come on and they'd hear that tone. But they said, what turned it on? And so the because the 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 individual light it wasn't on, I'd have to go down and take all the data out and I'd have to look through every data point and see that one little moment when it turned it on. So that's what a lot of what I had to do as an well, engineer. So for, for every time a master alarm would go off, you'd have to do that kind of I'd thing. have to be able to tell oh, them exactly wow. what caused it. So oh. you know that was tough because wow. we were really a primitive bunch over in that room. You know <laughs> with your slide rolls and your uh <laughs> And so I'd spend my day. I, I, they had what they call they fan fold. You know, you you take this just before we did this interview. One of the guys, uh, the son of one of the guys, worked with in the mission. Others, hey, he called me tonight, today, and he said, "Jerry, did you work on my dad?" I said, "Yeah, I did." He and I were sitting together in that. He worked for Grumman. I said, oh, "Well, yeah, my dad." Sure. Yeah, my, he said, "My dad ha had all these." These things, he had these long paper things, and he had circled there something about a half amp. Well, I knew what he was talking about. He was going to talk about those things we had to look at to see what turned on that alarm. You oh, know, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Grumman was the uh, – they, they made the little – Definitely. That's right. Yeah. But so, so, everybody so, saw, saw the movie. They love the scene where the, the, they make these square things, you know, these square filters. Yeah, that, that, was, that, that was one of the things that I, I think a lot of people have seen in the movies. The idea is that you, you, the, the need was there to filter out the carbon dioxide from the breathing air. Uh, and then so they had to jury rig a solution. So it was guys on the ground, you know, guys and gals on the ground, right, that, that figured out how to do that. Our guys. Our guys did there you it. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing that I, I love to give this story, you know. Because I built this. I give these talks. There's these square filters, and they wouldn't work in the system that was designed for the round ones in the lunar lander. Here's my oil filter. Okay. These were <laughs> round, and these were square. So our guys came up with this idea of how to make uh, this this filter this filter work in the round system and so here's what we did we knew there were bags on board for moon rocks and suit parts so we took the square filters put it at the mouth of the bag and then we knew we had a fan on board and here's my hose 
that we stuck this hose into this bag and this fan would kind of suck air through this Amazing. bag and the filter. But the problem is it's going to leak. And so that's where duct tape was on board and saved so, the Apollo astronauts. So everybody, always, please, carry your duct tape. Come on. You, you never know how <laughs> it'll save your life. You'll never be without it, Andrew. Wait, no, hey, believe it. I got my answer. Your wife. It's kind of funny. You were showing those those articles about uh, sort of representing jury, jury rigging the, the CO2 filter. Where if we were still open to the public, we were going to have that exact same hands-on activity because one of the objects we have on display is from Apollo 13, from from Lovell. It's one of the flight plan books. The the cover of which was ripped off to hold up the the inflated bag there. So yeah, we tell so the story in, in the museum. The reason the cover is missing is because because it, it saved their lives by covering up the CO2. <laughs> That's a great. That's a great anecdote. But but I, I I go around. I give a lot of talks about this. In fact, uh, uh, one of my talks is I, I Andrew. Now you may not want to do this, but I've written a song about duct tape. <laughs> wait wait wait. So you've written a song. What is it about? This is my duct tape song. Please. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Let's hear the duct tape song. Where their spaceship exploded. 200,000 miles of space, but too few round CO2 filters met. Death was in their face, but the damaged mothership had plenty that were square. But how do you make a square filter fit into a round hole? What's their prayer? So they looked around that spaceship to find a way and found something that just might work that day. No rocket science needed for this device. An old row of duct tape worked very nice. You've got to use what you have, have faith and believe, because the plain things in life are all free to receive. Failure's no option when problems show up. Simple things will help us thank God for everyday stuff. So thank you, Dr. Taylor. You all enjoyed that. Oh, man. You should have that over <laughs> I, I'm glad we got that in. All right, look, Jerry, I'm going to finish up with one uh, one final question for you to, to think about. Okay. So you, so you were there for the whole Apollo program and, and Apollo 13, of course, this, this big challenge that we celebrated 50, 50 years ago. But you're still there, an engineer work, working at NASA. To tell us a little bit about um, what are maybe some of the lessons learned that happened from that mission that you used it later on what? in your career or in life. Okay, the greatest mission I le thing I learned about is Apollo 13 will motivate people no matter what age you are. You go watch that movie, you hear my talk. I give about 60 talks a year for NASA. And at the end of every talk, I always give everybody a chance to uh, say my pledge. This is the pledge, Andrew. And so I want to make you an honorary Apollo 13 flight controller. Are you ready for this, Andrew? I would, I would okay, be there you go. Hand over the heart. Okay, hand over the heart. I'm going to make you official. I will do my best. I will do I will my do best. To achieve success in my goals. To achieve success in my goals. Neither fear, failure, nor frustration shall overcome me. Neither fear or failure or frustration shall overcome me. I am unstoppable. I am unstoppable. Unmovable. Unmovable. And unshakable. Unshakable. Failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. I have the right stuff. I have the right stuff. And because you got it, I'm going to send you one of these uh wristbands okay. and uh, i'll send you also i'll send you the official card so you will be an honorary apollo 13 flight controller and you can sign it put this in your artifacts okay i absolutely will uh thank you so much uh this has been a heck of a lot of fun learning about the details of the mission but also just uh meeting you as as a person and learning about uh, and being able to have some some time to talk about somebody that was there and continues to be doing amazing things in space. Thank you so much, uh, Jerry. Godspeed to you, Andrew, and to your guests. Bye-bye. Take care.